Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, Cambridge Sociology Seminar Series. This is the second um, seminar of the series this term. Today we have the pleasure of being joined by Professors Gurminder Bambra and John Holmwood, um, and they're going to be presenting on the book which they co-authored, which came out earlier this year, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory. Just by means of introductions, Professor Bramber is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies in the Department of International Relations in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex. And she is also a fellow of the British Academy elected in 2020. John Holman is Emeritus Professor of Sociology in the School of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Nottingham, having joined the school in January 2010. He was previously Professor of Sociology at the Universities of Edinburgh, Sussex and Birmingham. And in 2014 to 15, he was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. So, so many of us are really looking forward to this presentation because we know that debates over um, social theory and canonization and valuation of knowledge has really been at the forefront of discussions within our department and within our student bodies. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be able to talk with both Professor Bamber and Holmwood after they've written this book, themselves being at the forefront of these discussions in global academia. So I'll pass over to um, Professors Bamber and Holmwood. They're going to talk for around 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll have around an hour or so for a QA. and a um, For the questions, you're welcome to put them in chat. Otherwise, you're welcome also to raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and talk. If you're watching on YouTube, I have got my eye on the YouTube chat as well. So please do feel free to put your questions on the live stream as well. So I'll pass over to you two now, uh, Professors Holmwood and Bambra, we're really looking forward to this. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, start and let me say how, you know, pleased this is to, uh, to join you, particularly since I was an undergraduate and postgraduate uh, student uh, in SPS. And so it's uh, really nice uh, to be back. So, Essentially, we're talking about how our book relates to issues of decolonizing the curriculum and what it might mean to decolonize modern social theory. And essentially, we think there are two broad issues. The first is uh, thinking about the institutional benefits of colonialism to the development of Western education system, for example, through endowments, personnel, and so on. And the second issue is the intellectual legacy of colonialism in the organization of Western thought, especially the social sciences, and how that legacy continues in the period after colonialism and empire was formally brought to an end in most territories. So it's this latter question that's the focus of our book. And in it, we examine the colonial context within which contemporary European understandings of modern social theory have been formed. And we take seriously the colonial histories that were the context for the development of these ideas, but which are missing in most secondary treatments. And it's, I think, given uh, where the seminar is uh, taking place, I mean, or the physical location, if not the virtual location, to comment that it's exactly 50 years since the publication of Tony Giddens's Capitalism, Modern Social Theory. And of course, our title, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory, evokes his title, and deliberately so. It was an important book in which Giddens was in effect criticizing the Parsonsian construction of modernity and its foundational theorists where Marx was placed in the prehistory of what Parsons saw as a modern synthesis. Within Parsons' account, the role of capitalism and class are also elided. And Giddens presented his book as a work of restoration and of renewal. And we're proposing a similar undertaking is necessary with regard to colonialism. Indeed, we're also proposing that addressing the role of colonialism will alter how we understand capitalist modernity and its supposed core social division of class, which was the focus of uh, Tony Giddens book. And what we argue is that the displacement of colonialism from European social theory involves a double displacement where the rise of European imperialism out of colonialism is also neglected. <clears throat> 
in contrast to approaches that see imperialism as a late stage of capitalism, we see capitalism itself as emerging out of colonialism and imperialism to be the continuity of uh, colonialism. Now, the consolidation of modern social theory in the writings of Marx, Weber and Durkheim towards the end of the 19th century coincided with the height of European empires and would seem and would come to involve a global war between them. Yet colonialism and empire lies outside the dominant framing of modernity and is largely attributed to earlier historical periods and civilizations. And it's this kind of trajectory an idea of social development that we're addressing in the book. So we begin with the distinction between the state of nature and the state of society in Hobbes and Locke. They're frequently argued to inaugurate a discussion of what C.B. McPherson called possessive individualism, which he treated as an ideological construction that prefigured capitalism and indeed in some ways enabled it. And yet, the arguments of Hobbes and Locke are much more readily seen in the context of being justifications for colonialism rather than a precursor to something else. And developing on from the distinction of state and nature and state of society, we suggest that European social theory goes on to represent a history of different states of society can call that an analytical history of different states of society in a series of different types, and what is termed, would be termed a stadial or stages account of historical social development. And in constructing that account, the enslavement of populations, for example, comes to be represented as a pre-modern phenomenon and not as something integral to modernity notwithstanding the very extensive movement of populations as forced labor and the development of commodified chattel slavery that takes place within the modern period. So peculiarly, the modern period comes to be seen as a period of freedom, notwithstanding that it's a period of extensive coercion. Now we're suggesting that the absence of a direct and systematic treatment of colonialism and empire has had lasting consequences in the shaping of modern social thought and how it attends to social issues. And our treatment of Tocqueville, Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois, the authors we address in the book, is less to do with them as individual scholars and more the frameworks of social theory that they have bequeathed. That is, we're interested in the ways in which their work and commentaries on their work has come to establish the conceptual frameworks of social theory that organize current social inquiries. And as such, our purpose is to decolonize the concepts and categories they have bequeathed to us rather than simply critique the canon itself or add to it. And we suggest that this requires a process of contextual understanding and reconstruction. And as such, it's a critical reading, but we hope that anybody looks at uh, how we undertake it, that it's also careful and generous. That is, we're not uh, castigating the authors. What we're doing is seeking to examine their work in the light of the issue of colonialism, how it uh, intrudes in the work and how it's also displaced from the work. Because those who lived through colonialism and empire, including those who were its direct beneficiaries, could hardly fail to comment on it, even where they didn't recognize its true significance. But in not being central to their work, secondary commentaries have tended to omit it altogether in a process of what we call purification of the interpretations of the canonical tests. This, for example, is what we've suggested happens in Giddens' account of capitalism and modern social theory. 
So in dressing, addressing what they did write about colonialism and bringing it into the focus of attention, we seek to show how a proper accounting for colonialism and empire would disrupt the integrity of the category, categories they otherwise promote and open up new ways of thinking about modern social thought. As such, we're involved in what Raywin Connell calls the genre of commentary and exposition that engages the canon by reconstructing it from within. However, just as the enterprise of decolonizing the curriculum would be purely scholastic without an address of the inequalities and forms of domination that structure wider society, as well as the university, our concerns are also with the wider issues. The lead societies of modernity, to use Parsons phrasing, are currently beset by populism and xenophobic hostility to minorities and migrants. And these social divisions are as urgent now as issues of gender and class appeared in the period of the post Second World War settlement, when the canon of classical sociological thinkers was formed. Indeed, we believe that they are disruptive of aspects of that settlement and how the categories associated with it have been understood. And that's our primary uh, interest. The end of the Second World War, for example, was a period in which sociology and other social sciences expanded and were fully incorporated into university curricula in many countries. In Europe, this coincided with the dismantling of empires and the beginning of a new politics after empire. And it was a politics explicitly focused on the nation and its new social settlements, themselves associated with the growth of education, including public higher education. Sociology and social theory became centered on divisions framed as internal to the post-war developments of nation states. For example, the class stratification of outcomes and opportunities, or the gendered nature of public life and inequalities of power in the private sphere. During this period, however, most European countries were also confronted by anti-colonial movements and challenges to their global dominance. For example, there was a war of independence by Algeria from the French empire, which occurred simultaneously with Algeria being a subordinate part of the European economic community. So it's not quite true that uh, the European Union has avoided conflicts in the period since the Second World War, or at least it's only true if one uh, excludes the conflicts associated with independence movements from the component countries of uh, the European Union. And of course, India had earlier declared independence from Britain, and this was followed by movements for decolonization across the British Empire. And in the subsequent de decades, such movements systematically transformed the world order. However, these challenges, these uh, major political events, which challenged the political structures of European modernity, did not seem to impinge on what sociology saw as its jurisdiction, its domain of uh, inquiry. Rather, they were seen as the political entanglements of individual nation states, but not as defining their social structures or what was conventionally at the time called their societies. These events were not understood as the culmination and consequence of a systematic process integral to a modernity that was otherwise represented independently of them. And this is because colonialism and empire had not been part of the concerns of sociologists, even at its height. So the issue now couldn't simply be to add colonialism to sociology's repertoire of topics, but to show how that repertoire has been structured by the absence of its consideration and must be fundamentally transformed. As such, with the argument we're making is for a renewal of social theory and sociology, not an addition of another viewpoint to it or an out and out rejection, 
understanding sociology is historically formed would place it into conversation with those represented as other and open it to learning. And this is not a form of relativism or an argument for multiple perspectives, but for a transformation of what hitherto has been our own perspective as a consequence of learning from others. And I'll now pass over to Gaminda. Okay. So uh, thanks for that. I mean, the way in which we've organized this was that John was going to sort of set out the key themes that motivated how we came to write this book and, and what it was that we were interested in doing through the book. And what I'm going to do now is discuss the conclusion to the book where we organize the discussion around this idea of how social theory itself has been organized around five fictions, or this is what we're sort of presenting. And we suggest that these fictions could be understood in terms of a distillation of the lessons that could be learned from an examination of the classical tradition. So in the course of writing the book, as we were dealing with each of the thinkers, Tocqueville, Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois, what we sort of came to as we came to sort of finish writing the book was an understanding that there were five particular fictions that organize social theory that need to be addressed in any reconstruction of social theory. So the first of these fictions we suggest is associated with the idea of a state of nature. The state of nature was developed in Hobbes and Locke, or the idea of a state of nature was developed in Hobbes and Locke as part of their discussions of the possession and use of resources in common. It appears to establish a common humanity, but it does so in order to justify inequality and differential treatment. It's a construction which depends upon a distinction between the state of nature and the state of society, where the latter is the colonizing society of Europe. Out of this initial construction, there arises a concern to delineate the characteristics of modern society against which other societies can be described and classified. Once stages of society are delineated, it then became possible to arrange them hierarchically in terms of ideas of development and progress and to associate particular kinds of social relationship with each type of society. Now it's evident that colonialism is directly connected to the emergence of modern society, but it comes to be attributed to a late stage of feudal society involving encounters with people at earlier stages of development. The taking of other people into possession is then understood not simply as beneficial for those who derive profit from it, but also as a, in quotes, civilizing process for those who are subject to it. And so what we argue is that we need to move away from the idea of types of society, which can be understood separately from the relationships among them, and instead understand how it is those very connections that structure ideas of difference and domination. The idea of progress and the normative weight attached to it is connected to the second fiction, that of the special nature of modern subjectivity. Modern society is understood to inaugurate a distinctive kind of subjectivity that's associated with the modern individual and his or her self-determining capacity to act on the basis of reason and self-interest. This is the individual capable of property contrasted to those who are presented as either incapable of or indifferent to property. And yet these latter states are the product of European colonialism and they're not simply the condition it confronted. In the tradition of modern social theory, modern reason is about the development of autonomy and freedom and subjecting institutions, including those of religion, to criticism on the basis of reason. This construction is powerful because it also inaugurates the possibility of self-criticism, as is outlined, for example, in the approach of the Frankfurt School critical theory. The very idea of an unfinished project of modernity entails the idea of modernity itself <clears throat> as a project of civilization where all pre-modern societies are understood as beset by traditional authority and as inadequate selves. They are not seen as the basis of knowledge and experiences from which we can also learn. The third fiction is the idea of the nation state 
In the development of the idea of the modern individual, two forms of sovereignty are outlined. One is the individual as sovereign, and the other is that of the political authority that guarantees the liberty of sovereign individuals. In early modern thought, that political authority is associated with a commonwealth with no necessary territorial limits, and indeed in justifying the extension of territory. However, the exercise of political authority comes to be associated with nation states and with European nation states in particular. Weber's formulation has become the exemplary expression of this position within sociology. The nation state is understood to have a legitimate claim to the monopoly of violence within a given territory with legitimacy associated with the state's responsibility for and to its citizens within that territory. And yet not all members of the population are regarded as citizens or members of what Tocqueville called the society of equals. Further, all European nation states, including their settler offshoots, were either empires or participated in the construction of empires through the movement of their populations. And this latter movement both consolidated empires and contributed to their societies being in fact societies of unequals. Subjects of empire are denied inclusion in the community to whom the patrimony of empire is distributed. And after decolonization, they come to be denied citizenship within formerly colonizing societies. This is the context in which those who share a common political heritage of empire are now represented as immigrants within its metropoles, and as such are presented as threats to the solidarity of the nation and its social contract. The fourth fiction that we set out is that of class and formerly free labor. Marx recognized that modern society was developing as a society of unequals, that is, as a class divided society. This class division he associated with the system of private property. On the basis of the development of the class relation, proletarian agency would develop to transform private property and create the new society. The class division that Marx described depends upon the centrality of formerly free labor and the commodification of labor power within capitalist modernity. This role is called into question, however, once we understand the colonial and imperial nature of modernity. Commodified labor power does not develop as the central form of capitalism. And moreover, capitalist nation states are able to divide their populations between national citizens and colonial subjects. As Du Bois noted, this provides possibilities of the decommodification of labor power within the metropole through the use of colonial patrimonies in the provision of welfare and other collective goods nationally that are denied to those in the wider empire. At the same time, colonial subjects are denied the status of free labor and are subordinated within various forms of indenture. In this context, enslavement represents the commodification of the laborer while the abolition of slavery does not give rise to free labor, but to new forms of indenture. Both are enduring features of modernity. For example, in the present, indenture returns within the metropole in the form of the treatment of migrant labor as not deserving the rights and rewards associated with the citizenship status awarded to nationals. This is something that we see in the seasonal visa arrangements for migrant workers in post-Brexit Britain something which isn't a contingency of Brexit, but is deeply embedded in the social and political structures of modernity. Karen E. Fields, the recent translator of Durkheim, states that, and I quote, unreasonable divisions of humankind seem to be born from reason itself, not from its opposite. This leads to the final fiction of sociological reason. It's perhaps easy to understand that enlightenment thought has its darker side, and even to consider sociology as being both within and outside that tradition. However, sociology's task cannot only be to reveal that darker side, but also to consider its own implication in its construction. The dominant forms of sociological method, and indeed other social sciences too, all present sociological reason as a historical, <coughs> and as the necessary presupposition for objective inquiry. 
In this way, sociological reason is made part of the general claim of the Enlightenment. And sociology's difference is simply the extent to which it aligns itself with a critical project that continues it. As we have suggested, such a project is not the self-critical project it claims to be. Understanding society as historically formed would place it into conversation with those represented as other and open it to learning. As John said earlier, this is not a form of relativism or an argument for multiple perspectives, but what we're arguing for is a transformation of social theory as a consequence of learning from others. Arguing for a reconstruction of modern social theory is an argument for a transformation in the ways in which we understand the past that constitutes social theory, such that we can imagine new possibilities for the present and the future. To make a future different from our past requires us to better understand how we arrived in the present. It requires us to better understand the limitations of how that past has been understood by our discipline. So I'll end with this, that colonialism structures European modernity as well as European thought. And in consequence, recognizing its significance is an opportunity as well as a necessity to practice sociology and social science more generally, differently. Thanks so much, Gaminda. Thanks so much, John. That was um, so great to hear and such a great overview of the book. Um, it's available from Polity Press, so I'll put a link to it in the chat, and I believe that we have an e-copy of it in the Cambridge Library, so anyone can access it remotely. But I think that we also have hard copies of it throughout the Cambridge Libraries. Um, so we've got just around an hour or so for a Q&A. So as I said, you can either raise your hand and I'll come around to you, or you can put them in the chat on Zoom. If you're watching via YouTube, I have it open and you're welcome to put your questions in the chat there as well, and I'll come around to you. Um, typically, we like to start with a question from a student. Is there a student watching today that would like to begin the Q&A? Stella, is that a hand? You just need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether to write or share. Um, this is just a question about like uh, um, decolonizing like social theory and like to what extent um, like does decolonizing relate to other struggles for social justice and whether um, obviously it's distinct, but to how, how much can they be related to other struggles of like wider intersectional social inequalities or whether that kind of detracts from the main aim of decolonizing? I mean, I think in, in the way in which sort of John set out our aims at the beginning, there was a sense also that to do this work has to locate it within the politics of our time. It can't be something that's purely a scholastic exercise. So it's not trying to think about how to make social theory better for its own sake, but rather to think about the ways in which the forms of social theorizing that we have and that are dominant within the academy and more generally construct the ways in which we engage politically. And if there is something in relation to that that we think is problematic, then without transforming those concepts, we're also going to be limited in the possibilities of our politics in the present. So to give one example, which sort of comes out of um, the work that we're doing also more broadly is the way in which citizenship has come to be understood. You know, citizenship is associated with something uh, to, to developments with the modern nation state. And as the modern nation state comes into being, forms of citizenship are seen to also be associated with that, such that those who are understood to be citizens and perhaps more significantly understood to be the legitimate objects of public policy in the present are those who can demonstrate belonging to the nation. And the nation, as it's defined in part, at least by Weber, the nation state, and, and this idea, you know, no European country was a nation 
in the way in which the concept of the nation has come to be articulated. They were empires and they were imperial. And so there's a broader constituency that could be argued to have a claim to the benefits of the nation as it's now constructed because they've been part of having created that nation. And so by thinking about the histories that are embedded within the concepts that emerge through social theory and broadening out those histories to better account for the past that has produced them, we can hopefully develop better concepts and categories with which to think about politics and the present. And so in that sense, it's an intervention in the realm of social theory, but with the hope that those interventions would lead to transformations in the way in which we think about stuff, which would be useful in political engagements more broadly. I don't know if you want to add something to that, John. Yes, I mean, I think um, it's difficult to, uh, to how to understand figures that have entered the um, representation of the current uh, political debate, like the white working class, without understanding how that relates to colonialism and how whiteness becomes uh, privile privileged in that context as well. And, uh, and the second thing is I have a particular interest in uh, issues around Islamophobia and particularly the um, uh, treatment of Muslims within Britain and Europe uh, more generally. And we can see that the kinds of issues that are involved are there are also reflected within social theory through what was represented as the Jewish question. And uh, current fields that uh, Gomenda has already cited imagines a debate between Durkheim and Du Bois and says, well, what if the Jewish question had also been considered in the light of the Negro question, so-called that Du Bois uh, uh, set out and said that that was a, you know, a, fail, a failure to establish a dialogue where social theory could have uh, uh, been done better. And what it suggests is understanding that failure understanding the role of race and the issue of religion in that context. We can see why we're living now through something where we call Muslim question, where some fellow citizens have to live their lives as if they're a problem as a consequence of how colonialism has bequeathed certain kinds of constructions into to public debate. So very much engaged with current debates and uh, going back to find different uh, ways of, of thinking uh, about them. And the final thing I say is that we're not rejecting classical social theory. So in drawing an analogy as uh, Karen Fields does between the Jewish question in Durkheim and uh, the Negro question in Du Bois, what is suggested is that there are resources in how Durkheim thought about the Jewish question that could be used more widely once we break apart some of the uh, colonial restrictions that exist with, uh, and are placed upon uh, Durkheim's text. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kaminda. Thanks, Stada, for that great question to uh, kick us off. We've had a lot of questions now coming in on the chat and on YouTube, and I know a couple of you have raised your hands. So I'll just start with the first two questions because they're quite similar. So we have a question from Megan asking, how would you summarize the role of the education system in decolonization? And a question which relates to that, which is on YouTube is um, someone saying, essentially, will the mass follow the reforms in the academy? I.e. if the change is happening within the academy, how do we know that it can reverberate outside of academia itself? So I wonder if you can kind of take those two questions together. Yeah, shall, shall I go to that? Well, part of uh, decolonizing the academy is simply expanding the range of questions that are being asked and thinking about different answers in, those, uh, in relation to those questions. So it's not about taking anything out, it's about putting things in and as a consequence, putting things in thinking about things differently. That will lead to a displacement, but the aim is not 
it is not an it's not a uh, an aim motivated by a wish to displace it's an aim motivated by a wish to understand differently and as a consequence of understanding differently we act in relation to different texts different understandings as the basis of uh, you know fruitful uh, uh, future development how does it relate to things that are outside well of course sociology is always a part of the context in which it takes place it's not uh, the academy is not the vanguard the academy is a place of reflection and so it's important to engage with things that are taking place outside with social movements. And it suggests that uh, uh, sociology has always enriched itself by its engagement with social movements. And what it does is offer an opportunity for reflection. And reflection is, I think, really important if, for example, uh, social, you know, any social movement is not uh, a, a uniform progress forward it's also something that gets knocked back and you need to understand how that knocking back uh, takes place and academic reflection uh, can help do that. But the point is, I think, that sociology hasn't learned from movements of decolonization, hasn't understood colonialism in the first place to understand what the significance of uh, uh, decolonization is. And that's why we refer to a double displacement. And that's because one could say that other social movements, class, uh, gender, were disruptions within the national body politic. And uh, uh, post-colonialism, it was in a sense, a disruption from outside, or as it would be seen as from outside. And what uh, we think the task is, is to understand that it's equally a disruption from within. And so we're obligated to address it in terms of new forms of solidarity, which deal with our failure to uh, show forms of solidarity in the past. Thanks, John. Gaminda, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think, I mean, I mean, the only one thing I would add to that is partly is, is perhaps to say that, you know, the university is part of society. And so thinking about the function of the university in relation to knowledge and knowledge production, one would have to think that knowledge isn't only produced within the university, but something different happens to knowledge in the university, which is that it gets legitimated, it gets validated, and it gets amplified. And so one of the things that we do as academics in learning from others in struggle in different sorts of places is also to bring those ideas and that thinking into the academy as a way of sort of broadcasting those ideas further and that this can all has to always be thought of in as a dialogue you know so it's not something that we produce that we give outside it's because of what's happening outside that we change what we do and hopefully our change of that also enables those messages and those ideas to be spread further. Thanks, Gaminda. I'm gonna to go to the two um, people that have raised their hands and kind of take two questions at the same time. First, we have a question from, is it Shanaz? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, professors. That was very interesting. Uh, my question is uh, related to the first fiction um, and uh, just uh, the delineation of civilization uh, that you were talking about. And it just reminded me of um, Thomas Macaulay's famous line when he was trying to redefine education um, in India uh, for it to be more European. Where he said that um, a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Um, so now what's happening is that the pushback to this hierarchy that was built is to find a new place within it. And this is coming uh, from other exclusionary and populist politics, right? Um, especially I'm from India, so especially there you can see that. So um, how do we try and understand this now? Uh, yeah, thank you. So is, is the thrust of your question in relation to sort of the appropriation of some of the language of post-colonial and decolonial thought by right wing forces in other places who are mobilizing yes. it. Yes, yes. Thanks, Shanaz. And we're just going to take a question from David Lane as well, and then you can both respond to both of the questions. David, do you want to ask your question? 
<clears throat> I think you're muted if you're talking. What? Okay, we can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, well, doesn't it depend in some way as to what you define as social theory? I mean, there has been another tradition coming from historical materialism that has put empire and um, imperialism and colonialism right at its very center. For instance, if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, you've got theorists like Hobson, who's of course not very Marxist, but you've got Lenin and you've got people like Trotsky and Kautsky who made these ideas, particularly the ideas of imperialism, very central to their understanding of society. Furthermore, um, if you look at the studies of uh, development, for instance, people like Gunder, Gunder Myrdal and uh, Gunder Frank also had uh, put imperialism and colonialism really at the center of their ideas. So my question is, isn't your approach to social theory rather ethnocentric? And if you widen the idea of social theory to include these other developments which are taking place in countries like Russia, for instance, and China and Latin America, then you'd have a different idea what social theory was. And wouldn't this affect the way in which you're describing uh, the nature of imperialism? Thanks, David. So first we have a question about appropriation of language, and then we have a question about uh, definitions of social theory and, uh, I guess, theoretical myopia. Yeah, there are two um, questions. One, appropriation of language, and the other is a failure of appropriation. <laughs> Essentially. But maybe if I respond to the first uh, question first. I mean, I think, so the work that we produce in terms of thinking about the colonial period, there are ways in which some of that work gets done. And particularly if we're thinking about it in terms of issues of race or ethnic identity, often the sociology of race, for example, organizes itself in relation to structures of um, inequality or structures of identity. And these are often uh, modes that occur within particular states. And so the push as far as, for me at least, of post-colonial and decolonial critique and the bringing of that into sociology is to open up the question of the failure of sociology and social theory to take seriously the importance of colonialism. And by colonialism, we're talking about the historical processes initiated by Europeans from we can use the symbolic starting point of Columbus onwards, whereby Europeans traveled around the world, extracting, appropriating, dispossessing, eliminating, and, and so on, for the benefit of Europe and to the detriment of the rest of the world. And the way in which those historical processes are missing within standard accounts of social theory, including much of the Marxist tradition, to be um, honest in relation to this, but then the theories that get developed in relation to that. So where I'm getting to is that there is a lot of work within post-colonial and decolonial theory, which seems to have devolved into presenting accounts of identity. And it has lost, to my mind, its historical grounding in terms of thinking about the global inequalities that were established through processes of colonialism. And to the extent that it's become a form of identity politics, it becomes something that can be mobilized, not by those who are the poorest or the most oppressed or the ones in situations that are deeply problematic, but by dominant groups within society in order to promote a particular politics on a global stage, which also reinforces the status of the nation in particular ways. And we should be able to distinguish between these different uses of theoretical concepts and categories and not think that anybody who uses that term is necessarily in any particular way. So, you know, I'm not here to defend post-colonial theory or decolonial theory. I'm here to say that I have found particular provocations made by theorists within those fields useful for opening up new questions within my discipline, which is sociology, in order to think about the ways in which sociology has failed to take account of colonialism and therefore 
doesn't have concepts and categories that are appropriate for thinking about social issues in the present. And, and those social issues for me are grounded in understandings of socioeconomic inequality. That's what I'm most concerned about, not issues of identity. So I can quite happily critique people who use that language to promote a form of identity politics that doesn't take into account those broader structures of inequality. John, do you want to pick up the... Obsolete? Yeah, I'll just say briefly as well, one thing is that imperialist domination generates ethno-nationalism, but just because imperialist domination doesn't take the form of ethno-nationalism doesn't mean it's not implicated in it as a consequence of how it structures an idea of uh, developmental uh, progress and so on. And of course, in that respect, historical materialism is part of that tradition. So that's a general answer to David's question. Of course, uh, we do address Marxism and are quite aware that Marxism has an account of imperialism, but it has an account of imperialism in terms of a later stage of uh, uh, capitalism, and therefore it's the logic of capitalism that drives uh, imperialism rather than that there being a logic to colonialism that is continuous with uh, uh, capital. So we do critique in the book the idea that one can see colonialism as a form of primitive accumulation, then you get capitalism, then you get the return of imperialism. And of course, there are a lot of other writers we uh, could have considered, and it is uh, very relevant to consider writers from outside the European tradition. And indeed, in general, we're arguing for that. But in order to create a space within the European tradition for dialogue, one also has to critique the European tradition of social theory, uh, which is, which is uh, what uh, we do. Now, I do think it's a slightly puzzling, you know, some of the, and one doesn't want to get in too much detail about some of the, the arguments, but I mean, to cite Hobson, who were, you know, had pretty uh, straightforward racialized views, even to cite uh, Gunnar Medal. Gunnar Medal was a social eugenicist. The uh, American dilemma, which we would connect through to Du Bois and regard Du Bois as providing a superior account of uh, race in America through a global color line, uh, Medal at that point denies the relevance of a global color line, sees race in terms of the development of uh, uh, the American creed and is making an argument in a sense for the superiority of middle class America to which poor whites and African Americans should accommodate. And it should be remembered that he wrote the book at the same time as he and Alva Medal were promoting eugenic policies in, in Sweden. So I think that if one really engages with what these traditions were saying and what how European social thought is structured. We see their ramifications are deep and conceptual and are not gonna be solved by saying, there's a theorist here, there's a theorist there that are not saying that because the problem lies in the concepts itself. So that's what I said at the start, we're not really making any hostile comments about the particular authors or taking them to, task in that way, we're examining the nature of the concepts, because the concepts have a hold on our thought, and we're starting to break down and reconstruct uh, those concepts. That's the point. And that, I think, will, is what creates the space for a dialogue with others. You've broken down concepts, you've broken down their association with a stadial account, and that opens up the space for different kinds of dialogue. And that's our aim, dialogue rather than producing, well, this is the certain form that social theory must now take. Thanks for those questions. Thanks for those really detailed responses. I'm gonna go back now to some of the questions in the chat. So first of all, we have a question from Samina and she's asking, is your project one of improving already existing disciplines and or ways of knowing, 
or is it a call for a dismantling of disciplines and current ways of knowing and doing research? I may be misunderstanding you, but it seems to me that you're not divorcing your argument fully from the fiction of rationality and the methodological implications that come from it. I mean, the way that I would present this is that there are different ways in which people approach the project of decolonizing within the academy. One approach is to find voices, authors, scholars who have not been engaged with in the same way that Tocqueville, Marx, Weber, Durkheim and Du Bois now are engaged with and sort of think about what else we can learn from these people who haven't been as dominant within those disciplines and, and so on. And what we wanted to do within with this book is to also take issue with the fact that it's not about the authors as such and that yes, we can find lots of other voices and lots of other people saying very many things and we can construct different understandings in relation to what it is that they say. But if we don't also address the structure of the discipline, the conceptual architecture of the discipline that has been brought into being as a consequence of the particular tradition that has been dominant, then we can get rid of the thinkers, but the concepts and categories and the way they've been shaped and the ways in which they organize our discipline will remain. And so what we're taking aim at is the inadequacy of the histories that have been the basis for the construction of concepts and categories within our discipline and how taking a broader account of colonial histories and using those histories as the basis of rethinking these categories and concepts that we can take things in other directions because what we're aiming for is the transformation of the very conceptual architecture of the discipline. And so in that sense, Yes, I'm not, I mean, is that a rational argument? Is there a pro, you know, I mean, that's part of the, no, go on, John, what were you going to? Well, I'm cross about the accusation. So, uh, well, uh, you know, because I've always argued against there being a set of presuppositions that can stand outside uh, inquiries and be, well, so long as you agree on this set of uh, presuppositions, we can then engage in uh, a dialogue uh, and so on. Our argument straightforwardly is all categories are at issue in the process of uh, thinking about problems and trying to come up with solutions to problems. So we don't have a view that, uh, a, you know, we do have a view that there are problems and that problems uh, are shared, but they're shared from different perspectives and different consequences. Some are beneficiaries, some are uh, disadvantaged, uh, and so on. But we're not arguing that the solution of problems is an approach towards truth. What we're arguing is that you can talk about the solution to problems. It's not, uh, we're not making a relativist argument, but instead of thinking of an approach towards truth, think of it as leaving a particular formulation of a problem uh, behind. And in that way, others participate in the process, you uh, learn from them, and you're not saying, well, there's this set of categories which you can, once you've accepted these uh, categories, you can enter into the debate. We're saying, if you wish to put these categories at issue, we accept that they are put at issue. So this is different from, say, other approaches within social theory, critical realism, for example, or any other ideal types that establish frameworks which are themselves outside the process of discussion and uh, reformulation. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kaminda. Thanks, Tamina, for such a great question. Uh, I'm going to move to the next one from Eva or Eva. It's, let's say, broadly historical um, because they're asking how we can better account for the role of the abolition of slavery for the democratic. So I think that this question is essentially asking what role did abolition play 
in the development of democracy around the era of the French and Haitian revolutions um, and within the constitution of the United States. So I guess it's kind of a question of, first of all, how sociology has really engaged with that history of enslavement and abolition. And then secondly, the more historical question of, you know, what was the role of abolition in the greater process of democracy more broadly? So I think there are sort of a number of stages in, in answering this question, because in a sense, most accounts of democracy only focus on the French Revolution and the US Declaration. They, you know, they, they don't engage with Haiti at all, except that the Haitian Revolution has become more popular as a topic in recent times. And so more people are aware of it. But to take the Haitian Revolution seriously, which for those of you who may not know, was a revolution that established an independent state of Haiti, fought for by people who had been enslaved and who fought both for their liberty from enslavement, but also for their liberty from colonization. And that is something that's quite distinct from the French Revolution and the US Revolution, because the US Declaration of Independence was about um, a furthering of settler colonialism and the French Revolution never forswore against uh, clo uh, colonization, even if for a short period as a consequence of events that were happening in, in Haiti, it did confirm the abolition of, of enslavement in the French territories, but this was then reintroduced by Napoleon in 1802. And so in that sense, what the to simply add the Haitian Revolution to France and the US without actually fundamentally altering how we understand democracy is problematic. And it's problematic because it maintains colonization and forms of hierarchy as embedded within our understandings of democracy. And we fail to think about those hierarchies if we don't sort of use the instance of the Haitian Revolution to really unpack that. Secondly, there's an issue that the abolition of slavery when it did happen in the mid 19th century was immediately followed and is actually sort of concurrent with forms of indenture. So abolition was not replaced by free labor. Abolition was replaced by new forms of coerced labor. And this time the populations were taken not from West Africa, but from India and China and the Indian Ocean world more generally. The forms of coercion that were involved were very similar to those of the slave trade that had existed between West Africa and the Americas. There were some differences, but it's not straightforward that it was free labor that replaces um, uh, enslaved labor. It's coerced labor effectively that replaces that. And so we need to think about the ways in which our accounts of democracy, A, fail to account for the fact that colonization, enslavement, subjugation and extraction are central to those accounts. And even to the extent that we've begun to start engaging with the abolition of slavery, there's hardly a scholarly work within the social sciences that takes indenture as something that needs to be reckoned with in terms of what it continues to mean for what we claim are democracies, because indenture wasn't abolished until 1921, so after the First World War. You know, this is a dominant system of organization and we can see how the plantation economies that existed in the Caribbean, the US, Southern America, and also in the Indian Ocean world and across India as well, are reproduced in contemporary tea and coffee plantations. I mean, we still use the same word, and yet where we, we somehow think that it's free labor, yet there are so many reports that talk about those continuities that exist in these modes of organization, which are not there. So I think we need to really think more deeply about what it is that we're assuming democracy to be. And then if we're interested in thinking about the relationship of slavery and the abolition of slavery to that, we also then need to broaden our scope to take into account indenture and ongoing forms of plantation economy that continue to structure uh, modes, of, modes of labor and employment across the world. Can I just add to that because, just because there were previous questions about the, the curriculum. So if we say that uh, 
Tocqueville's Democracy in America was a set book within the US curriculum, within schools and also within universities. It was an edited edition that was used and the chapter that was removed was the chapter on the three races that inhabit the United States. The chapter, that's the chapter that includes the treatment of uh, uh, Native Americans and also uh, African Americans, enslaved uh, Africans. And it was removed because it was judged unnecessary in the 20th century to have those chapters in. Now, what we know roughly about the book is that uh, de Tocqueville, in a sense, predicted the genocide of Native Americans, and he considered that African Americans would remain a threat to democracy uh, in America, despite the fact that their treatment was under the categories of democracy tyrannical. So it's generally viewed as perhaps somewhat sympathetic to the idea that slavery was uh, an evil introduced uh, into uh, America and created a, a long-term problem. But what do we make of the fact that Tocqueville said nothing about Haiti? And despite discussing democracy in the modern world and taking the US as his uh, paradigmatic example and making the contrast with uh, France. And what do we make of the fact that when he treats Algeria, he justifies slavery in Algeria. So we have uh, a disco one where if we were within an American school system, we couldn't read the chapter that creates a problem that we wouldn't find anything about Haiti. And if we were in France, we'd be fully conscious and committed to the colonial project that uh, Tocqueville endorsed in Algeria, which also included enslavement. So it's really fundamental to the texts that we regard as canonical that these issues are there and somehow removed from us, either by the act of the author, I'm not going to talk about Haiti, or the act of editors and commentators. Thanks for those responses, uh, really informative again. I'm going to go to Manali now, who has a question for you. Can you hear me? Because I'm working with a new computer. Can you hear me? OK, thanks. <laughs> So um, thank you very much for that. It was really interesting and, and very, um, very clear, actually. And um, I wondered whether I, I could sort of press you on the prefix D um, in front of decolonial or decolonizing. Um, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this as a sympathetic listener and, and you know, as someone who's sympathetic, but also with uh, someone who has um, some questions about this, this prefix. And I say this as someone who's worked in India for a long time, <clears throat> a country that was obviously colonized for, for a very long and protracted period of time in a way that was really messy and uneven and um, very difficult to encapsulate in a singular narrative of any kind. And partly this is because of the um, uneven regional effects of different types of you know, changing policies and alliances with local groups. Um, so that when decolonization actually happened, decolonization decolonization itself was a messy, uneven, unequal process <clears throat> that produced many of the effects we see today. So I think there's one, the first point is really to, to say or to push you on thinking about whether decol decolonial theory should have a better relationship with decolonial histories uh, or decolonizing practices in, you know, in, in history, in actuality. And the second is whether a failure to do that um, might leave it open to the kinds of appropriations that um, I've written a little bit about and others have written about as well, which is to say that actually becomes very easy then in the, for decol decolonial theory, to be appropriated by those who would divide um, the world into colonizers and colonized without um, recognizing their own complicity in 
in the former, if you if, if you know what I mean. So um, yeah, so that's just, just sort of my question and my reservation about um, the way in which perhaps the, the prefix D might flatten the critique rather than sharpen it and whether we need to expand the tools a little bit more. So, thanks. I mean, thanks for the, the question, Manali. I mean, so my take into this is partly to say that I'm working on these themes and these topics from here, that's Britain. And the orientation of the critique for me is in part to think about the ways in which British education, scholarship, academia, politics acknowledges or not the colonial histories that have also shaped it. So colonization isn't something that just happened to those who were colonized, but it also influences those who were the colonizers. And in that context, and again, I take a very, if you like, socioeconomic or, or material take in relation to the histories, and it's almost a sense of follow the money. You know, so what so a piece of work that I've been doing recently has been about looking at taxation and looking at the institution of income tax. So the British state established income tax in India in 1860. And at this time, the working class and most of the middle class in Britain was not subject to income tax. They didn't get uh, called to pay income tax until part of the way through the First World War. So for 60 years, you have Indians that are colonial subjects above a certain uh, income threshold, but nonetheless, all of them having to pay income tax, which comes into the British Exchequer and is used to uh, establish funds for national insurance, social welfare projects, etc., for national citizens. And this money is just part of the 45 trillion that Utsap at Naik and others have documented that Britain extracted from India over two centuries. That extraction and that, both the extraction that occurs in an imperial context and the failure to redistribute what's been extracted and how that redistribution only occurs within a national context, I think is significant for thinking about debates around welfare entitlement, migration to Britain, in the present, because what it demonstrates is that the national patrimony that some people wish to defend only for those who can demonstrate a history of belonging to Britain has actually been paid for and funded through the lives, livelihoods, taxes, resources of colonial subjects. And none of that has been redistributed to them. So what do we do in the present in Britain in making an argument around how global inequality needs to be addressed. And for me, that would have to be through a reparative frame. We have to think about the topic of reparations when we think about decolonization, but decolonization without reparations doesn't um, account for that past and doesn't address the inequalities that have been established as a consequence of that. And at the same time, decolonize, well, both the period of colonial rule and the period of decolonization, as you're saying, occurred very differently for different populations within India. So the mass of famines that occurred where all, close to 60 million people starved during the period of the introduction of the income tax in India in 1860 and 1920, the majority of them would have been Dalit them from the lower classes. I think it's something like almost 80% of the deaths come from what are presented as the lowest castes. And so the impact of colonization through the production of or, you know, colonially produced famines isn't having a consequence on the entire subcontinent. And it's not having a consequence on all demographics equally. It's having a disproportionate impact on those who are the poorest, the most vulnerable, the most oppressed. And very few scholars within India, and I'm thinking here also of the subaltern studies scholars, address caste, the internal form of hierarchy and inequality that structures Indian society. So I find it extraordinary, you know, so the work that I do is the work from here, because I grew up here. This is what I know. I didn't grow up in India, although I have ancestral connections to India and stuff. And so I'm interested in this. 
but I find it remarkable that scholars in India are not bringing together the broader critique of decolonization with internal hierarchies as established through caste and thinking about those things, because these are complex, but we can hold different thoughts in our head at the same time. And no one project I think is able to do all the work. And that's why in a sense, what we're hoping to do with this book is open up these questions for us here and how they get taken up by others in other places. It will be interesting to be part of those conversations. Can I just add to that? Because I don't think actually we do very much use the D prefix. And the reason why we don't is, or we use it in the context of decolonizing the curriculum. The problem with decolonizing the curriculum is there's not really a treatment of colonialism in the curriculum. So you have to put it in, you know, so it's not a, a D movement. But also, I think, you know, if I uh, address what the the problem of addressing colonialism and after the end of formal uh, empire, if we put it uh, in that way, I think came up, the, and perhaps this will um, uh, relate to the, the question that David uh, asked at the beginning. We, we were listening, listening to um, uh, an LRB lecture that involved Mahmoud uh, Mandani and talking about uh, the problem of uh, uh, decolonization and its incompleteness in the in the way that you're suggesting, and what it uh, revealed was a distinction between the political and the economic, in which colonialism and decolonization uh, were seen largely in political terms and the creation of an independent state, whereas the economic was regarded as to do with capitalism. And what it struck me was that there was a failure to understand the colonialism within the economic or a failure to discuss the colonialism within the economic. And if you'd say, well, what is it that, you know, that David was saying, well, you know, Marx and capitalism and Marx historical materialism on capitalism has addressed the economic adequately, which deals with Im imperialism. What it has missed, I think, is what colonialism bequeaths to the world, and we see it particularly in the climate crisis, is a particular form of appropriation and possession of land and dispossession of others from, from land. And that structure of land ownership, access to resources that lie beneath the land and on the land is actually the legacy of colonialism. And that has not really been uh, decolonized. So what people tend to do is see decolonization in terms of the political rather than in terms of the economic. And that's because they are accepting what is essentially uh, you know, a, a theory of modernity of the separation of the economic and the political, and that these are structures that can be dealt with uh, independently of each other. And I think if we call it instead of a decolonial approach, a post-colonial approach or an approach that takes colonialism seriously would put the political and economic back together. And in that way would, yeah, absolutely establish the you know, truth of what you've uh, just said. Thanks, Kaminda. Thanks, John. Thanks, Manali, for that great question. Uh, we've got around 15 minutes left, so I can see Mel's has got their hand up. Before I go to Mel's, I'm just going to take this question from Naomi, um, who is asking, because once again, it's on this theme of decolonial and decoloniality, and they're asking whether there's a paradox in the basis of this paradigm, especially through its, you know, notion of pluriversality, and whether... Um, you can actually have an idea of truth from a post or decolonial perspective. And if you do have a version of truth, how do you have truth without having hierarchies of knowledge? So, well, I don't think you need a concept of truth. You need more or less adequate. You don't need to say that uh, you don't need a transcendent category of truth outside knowledge's situated nature 
to recognize that a more adequate uh, account is transformative. It's not transformative in the sense it removes you from the situatedness of knowledge. It retains the situatedness of knowledge. It just creates a new situation, a new situation which you can understand as both different from what preceded it, related to what preceded to it, and more expansive, both in terms of who it includes and how it addresses the inequalities that were associated with past limited inclusions and uh, forms of, of exclusion. So that's why I say, well, uh, uh, the, you, to oppose relativism, we don't need a concept of truth. What we need is, a con uh, is conceptions of adequacy, conceptions of problem solving and criteria of uh, problem solving associated with inclusion. And as soon as you have a process of inclusion, you have a process of past exclusion. And so you have to attend to how that ex exclusion was created. And that opens what Gaminda was saying was the reparatory, the reparative aspect of uh, uh, you know, probably, you know, that you can't recognize a past exclusion without understanding what it bequeaths to the present and how you need to repair that. And so justice can never be only distributive once you understand knowledge as situated knowledge and transformed situated knowledge, you, then uh, justice also has to be reparative. Thanks, John. Kaminda, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, I think that was a great response. Okay, then Mouse, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much for a um, really interesting presentation and um, yeah, really interesting reflections on all of those previous questions. Um, my question was related to um, the kind of five fictions that you identified, which I found really interesting and just a really interesting way to think about um, those particular um, elements of social theory. And I wanted to kind of get your reflections. I think it kind of relates to the question that's just been answered as well, actually, um, just about the, devi the device of fiction itself. And so whether those fictions were problematic because they were produced as truth, or is there a problem with the device of fiction um, within sociology, which well, I'll let, I'll let, I'll let you um, kind of reflect on that. And then just thinking about whether there is like a, any liberatory like possibility within fiction itself. And so if the state of nature wasn't like conceptualized as a state of war, it was conceptualized as something else, how would that like kind of co collectively transform how um, we look at society today and whether that's a way of like moving forward um, as opposed to and rejecting kind of fictions in themselves. I hope that makes sense, but yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for that, Mills. So I think what we're trying to do with the use of the term fictions is in part to sort of say, these are things, these are categories of social theory. And these are categories that have almost sort of foundational status within sociology, the social sciences more broadly. And yet the way in which these categories have been developed and understood has been without taking into account the colonial histories that are also part of the period when people are reflecting on these issues. And so if we call them a fiction, we can think more carefully about the ways in which they've been constructed. We can think about the histories that also existed at that time, and we can think about how they can be reconstructed. And that's not necessarily you know, so because that, that then does sort of refer to the previous question and answer, because it's not then having a truthful category to replace the fictional category. It's about having a more adequate category. And again, how do we measure the standards of adequacy? Well, it should enable the, ca the category in terms of adequacy should be able to explain more than the previous one did. It should be able to make sense of different experiences in a way that the previous one didn't. If we recognize an exclusion, we can't simply add what had previously been excluded and continue as normal. Truyo has this nice phrase that you can't simply add native stir and continue as normal. Adding the native has to make a difference to how it was that we had conceptualized the world before we'd thought 
about those others who now we say also need to be included. So it's a, a push towards reconstruction and around this idea of adequacy, which is I think what it is that we would want to be doing with this. Thanks, Commander John, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I, and I th do think, you know, narratives are important because they do, they're how people are mobilized to do things. So you, you know, uh, uh, I use uh, an analogy, you know, and people might find it's an unfortunate one, but uh, if you're thinking of rehabilitation in prison, uh, sociologists are very good at saying what the social structural causes giving rise to crime and imprisonment are. But for the person who seeks to ch turn their life around, they need a story. First, I was like this, then I became uh, something else. They need a redemptive story. And that's one of the reasons why I think religion still remains as powerful and still remains powerful, not as the opium of the people, but as a mechanism by which people can understand their lives and understand how to change them and uh, bring about uh, you know, new circumstances. So, and it's quite important, but I'll go back because uh, uh, Guminda knows the chapter that gave uh, uh, me most pain was writing critically about Durkheim. But uh, I think we managed to find a way to say that, well, actually Durkheim is the one social theorist who's, sim who's sympathetic to that view. Science and religion are not competing. Religion is not pathological. Religion is real in the Durkheimian sense. And it's real in the Durkheimian sense because it gives meaning in the way that you have suggested in terms of a narrative of change. Because what, uh, as Durkheim says, what the idea of the soul does is connect you to the past and to the uh, future. When people talk about, well, we'll need to dis you know, consult the ancestors, what the ancestors give them is a connection between past and future. And what we have in the West is we have no, you know, we won't recognize our ancestry and we don't recognize our commitment to the future. That's part of what the climate crisis is about, that modern subjectivity has landed as almost in a permanent present. And so I think narratives are absolutely, um, you know, vital. Thanks so much, Sean. Thanks so much, Gaminda. We've only got five minutes left and there have been a couple of questions that have come in, um, but they're both roughly around the questions you kind of took at the beginning in terms of what does all of this really mean for, you know, decolonizing academia um and the role of academia in wider publics which you kind of engaged with already so one way that we kind of like to end the seminars is just for the um for the guest speakers to recommend us a text that we can reflect on so i was just wondering as a closing question whether you can both recommend something you've read recently or maybe something that's been really formative to your thought on this particular topic that we can now go and study in our own time I'll start while Gaminda's thinking. I will recommend Karen E. Field's translation of Durkheim's Elementary Forms of the Religious Life and reading the first chapter of that because it was, you know, a it's a model of um, uh, sort of critical thinking and engagement of the text and sort of let us in a sense, see what it would be to engage with a text sort of in a generous and critical way. And, and then follow it up with her article on the dialogue between Du Bois and uh, imagining a dialogue, uh, particularly since the was imagining a narrative, imagine a dialogue between Du Bois and Durkheim. And it's really quite uh, exciting what she comes up with. Yes, yeah, so I just, I mean, in the chat, I put a link to the Connected Sociologies website, and that was in relation to one of the questions in the chat about do you envisage your, envis, envisage your roles as academics changing in the coming years? And I think partly it's this sense that thinking about spaces through which we can uh, 
share ideas and understandings and thought that isn't only based within the academy, but the academy also gives us the space to be able to do these sorts of things. So there's the Connected Sociologies Project. John and I also co-edit Discover Society, which we set up about eight years ago as an online magazine. You know, and these are all free resources that are available. There's the Global Social Theory site, which is another way that we try and broaden the scope of how we understand theory and think about theory and, and so on. And so in that sense, it's, I think the university is changing, has changed, and yet we can still find spaces within it to do the work that we think is important and make sure that that work is rooted in the world beyond the university. So it's not just about arguments that occur within these spaces, but it's about the relevance that those arguments have to what's going on beyond those spaces. And in terms of um, a, a reading, I mean, John and I earlier were just talking about Danielle Allen's book, Talking to Strangers. I think, you know, both of us regard that book incredibly highly. And she also has a, a, an essay on citizenship and inclusion and exclusion, which I found to be one of the most uh, profound conceptualizations of rethink or of transforming the ways in which we often think about things in terms of inclusion and exclusion and instead conceptualizing them in terms of hierarchies of oppression and domination and so if we can shift our understandings from inclusion and exclusion to domination and oppression that actually really shifts the ways in which we think about questions of equality and community in, in very particular sorts of ways. So I think Daniel Allen is brilliant. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, John and Gaminda, for giving up your time to talk with us today for that hour and a half. It was really, really informative for all of us. I'm sure we all really appreciate it. If you ever do want a pick me up, you can go and watch the video on YouTube because Gaminda, you've got quite a few fans saying how much they love you <laughs> with, uh, with endorsements. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much everyone for joining us on Zoom. Um, and we're going to meet again in two weeks where we have Michael Rossino, who is going to be talking about the drug war in the US and its relation to wider racial and class politics. So thanks so much, John. Th thanks so much, Gaminda. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. They were really